So the city is going to build little garages for prostitutes to be in so people can get these drive-through hookups. And, of course, the city's going to tax it and, all and make money out of it anyway. Uh, this is the strange woman. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. This is the spirit now behind this. You listen. You just listen to the scripture without being mad for a second. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline unto her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. I had asked the question last night, does hell have chambers or rooms? You remember what the NIV says, in my father's house are many rooms. That's not what the King James says. So the spirit behind this, the one that wants to slay you, is the strange woman, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination. How about this one? If you're not mad now, hang on. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height to the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the side to the pit. Here we are back down in the pit again, down in hell. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of the grave like an abominable branch, and as a remnant of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet." Think of someone being slain in the spirit. It's, they're like dead now. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. I want to ask you a question. Is God the giver of death or life? He's the giver of life. It's the, who's the murderer? Who? Answer the question in the Bible. Who is the slayer? Who's the murderer in the Bible? Jeremiah 25, 33, this, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, they neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. I mean, let me show you this picture again. Let me read, you look at this, and let me read this verse again. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. So even in the place, even in the place in the Bible, where it talks specifically about the slain of the Lord, this is not a blessing. This is not some great thing that, oh, I hope to be killed by God. Oh, I want Jesus to slay. That's not some beautiful thing. It's your dung upon the earth. You're not even buried. Your carcass. You know what? You know what the dung of the earth implies? What happened to Jezebel? The prophet Elijah told Jezebel, "You're going to be like dung out in the field." You know what happened? The dogs. When her body was thrown out the tower, the dogs came and ate her up. Guess what happened a few hours later? She became dung in the field. Exactly the way the Bible said was supposed to happen. Will you not listen to the scriptures, people? Jeremiah 51, 49. As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, 
so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Who, who caused this to happen? Well, in Proverbs 7, we find it's the strange woman. He said back in Psalm 89, that has broke Rahab in pieces. You remember who Rahab was in the days of Jericho? She was a harlot woman. Here, Jeremiah 51, it's Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall. Babylon caused the slaying in the spirit, not God. Babylon did this. Ezekiel 6. I have an itch up in my nose. <laughs> all right. Ezekiel 6, verse 6. In all your dwelling places, the city shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate. Blessing or curse here? Good or bad? It sounds bad. That your altars may be laid waste and made desolate, and your idols may be broken and cease, and your images may be cut down, and your works may be abolished. And the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And you, say, and you can say, well, see, it's from God. He's revealing his presence to us. No, you go back and read this again. God's saying, you want to worship other idols? You want to go commit whoredoms? You want to do all this nasty, vile stuff and despise me? When you start seeing people being slain and falling down, you're going to know who's God. That's what he's saying. Ezekiel 16, verse 20. Moreover, I always wanted to have a dog named Moreover. There was one in the book of Luke. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Anyway, putting the fun in fundamentalism. Ezekiel 16, verse 20. Moreover, thou hast... Listen to this now. And I'm, I'm going to show... In fact, I'm going to put this up on the screen. I want you to look at this for a second. Does that look right to you? Burn. 24-7. Um... Contend, worship, blaze, the burning ones. We're the burning ones. In fact, you can't be a burning one unless you go to the burning one discipleship school. Um, that doesn't sound right to me. It does not sound, that's not good. Read, um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to break away here just for a second. How much time do I have? Uh, I have got to be... Uh, if you watch our church service, you know we have some very special guys come to our church from a group home. Uh, they're disabled in a lot of ways. One of them's name's Frank. Frank's my buddy. And uh, Frank has a checkers tournament every year, and I got invited. And that guy almost beat me. I mean, he's good, okay? And um, so anyway, I got to be at his checkers tournament at 3, and I don't want to miss that. But anyway, listen to this, okay? Uh, let's see here. I'm in the book of James, and uh, I am looking for what James said about the tongue. What did he say here? Oh, here we go. Here we go. Verse 3, James chapter 3, verse 3. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which th though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small hem, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, I don't have all the answers here, but uh, th to me there is a very, very deep connection between human words and the power of the tongue and the releasing of the Antichrist. What was it in Genesis 11 that they did and then what God did? Because they were all of one language and they said, go to let us, and they said, go to let us. And then what did God do? Because they were trying to build the beast. What did God do? Let's confuse their tongues. And so look here. Confusion of tongues. So look at it. Verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. 
and the tongue is a fire. A world of what? Iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. And I look at this right here. Somebody sent me this, and I'm just going, Duh, no, huh, that ain't right. Because in their promotional video, that's exactly what they say. They say, we're going to set the world on fire. We're going to burn the whole world. And I'm just going, uh, that, no, huh, that don't sound right to me. Listen to this. Okay. Back in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 20. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? Whoredoms, remember? Here we are back again with whoredoms. Verse 21, that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. What does Todd Bentley go around doing? What does he do? He goes around laying hands and saying, Fire! Fire! Ah, you're on fire! You're all on fire! Um, ben the Hen does the same thing. Fire! There's fire everywhere! If I was there, I would leave the building. It's on fire. Get out! What's on fire? Hell! But you say, well, God's a consuming fire. Yeah, what's he doing? He is using hell to consume. Hell belongs to him. Should I be slain? When I, get, when I get saved, should I seek to be slain in the spirit and fall backward? Because, you know, they never put the catchers in front of somebody. They always put them behind them. Come on, I got you now. And then there's always the nice Pentecostal lady with the blanket to cover the dresses. So, you know, okay. It's not right. It is not right. It is unbiblical. It is dangerous. It is spoken against in the scriptures. And you're not to be doing it. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you've been slain in the spirit, you are, forget it. You're going to go to hell. I went... I kind of provoked God a little bit. I think I had an honest heart. I was trying. And God spared me from it. I've had people come to me in this ministry, in emails and whatnot, and said, Pastor Mike, I'm, one lady in particular I remember from over in the West Coast, she was telling me, she said, we went to, we went to see the hen, man. The hen blew on us, and, and we like got kundalini all up and down her spine. It gave us the doodads and the wiggles and everything else. And we just thank God that God saved us out of that stuff. That's my point. I'm not saying that if you've already encountered this experience, why are you listening to me? Because you're going to hell anyway. What I'm saying to you is, this is an unbiblical practice. It does, and I want you to listen, if it doesn't come from the Bible, where does it come from? If it's not from God, and clearly in the scripture, you cannot point and say right here in the book of Acts chapter 14, verse 8, the apostles laid hands on their foreheads and they were slain in the spirit. It's not there. The blood atonement is. The nailing of ordinances, of ordinances is. The crucifixion of Christ is. The, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is, and it explains everything that they did in plain terms, everything. The Bible, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So if I'm to believe it, I am to get my belief from all Scripture. And so far... All scripture is telling me, I mean, I've got verses here from Ezekiel and Psalms and Proverbs, and it just keeps going. I've got all these scriptures here, and all scripture is doing nothing but telling me, uh, Mike, you're not really supposed to be slain in the spirit. Uh, your spirit uh, is supposed to be alive. God's not going to kill your spirit as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. Even in baptism, what does baptism show? Now, I have never baptized somebody that when I went to put hands on them, they collapsed.